go ahead and get started because we want to get to the the meat of our presentation today here from Mark and not myself. <laughs> so I just want to welcome everybody. I am Stacy Chandler and I'm a marketing specialist with Advantage Kentucky Alliance. And I just want to say thank you for coming and to let you know that we will be recording the presentation today for you to um, view in the future or share. Um, we do put it on YouTube. Um, so you are welcome to visit that uh, platform to see it and we will send the link in an email. Um, I send out a, kind of a thanks for coming email uh, with the link and then also we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, so there'll be a survey attached too because um, we'd love to know what types of uh, webinar topics um, you want to um, see presented in the future. Uh, so Kim Crawford is also here. She is um, with AKA as well, and she's going to be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions or comments, just feel free to put them in the chat, and she will be um, keeping an eye on that. And uh, Mark will have a little break in between to, to check on questions. And of course, we can have some more question and answer at the end. Um, so and before turning it over to Mark, I'd like to introduce AKA to people who are not really familiar with who we are and what we do. Um, so this is a little brief introduction to um, our company, Advantage Kentucky Alliance. Um, we are part of the National Manufacturing Extension Partnership, also known as MEP. Each state has their own representative. Um, we function under the umbrella of NIST. Um, we have a federal grant that is managed by Western Kentucky University. So we are a consultancy but we offer our um, services at um, a lower cost than a, a private consultancy because we're considered public private. Um, our goal is to support and um, retain and grow manufacturing here in our state. Um, that is our passion. We want to walk alongside our manufacturers, keep our finger on the uh, pulse of the manufacturing industry here in Kentucky. Um, so the way we do that is we set up our manufacturers with a sales um, client service manager, excuse me, and they will come have a short meeting just to find out where you stand um, and to see if there's anything that we can help you with, either challenges or growth opportunities. Um, that reminds me to tell you, too, that we will have um, some more. Um, we'll have a workshop coming up called Export Tech. So please see our website to find out more about that. And that will uh, cover some exporting education. Uh, so basically we want to help you. And if you'd like to have a consultation set up, send your information through the chat and Kim will take note of that and uh, we'll get in touch with you about um, a meeting. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop talking and turn the, um, turn the uh, time over to Mark. So we can get started. So I'm going to put myself on mute and Mark, I'm going to stop sharing so you can go ahead and put your information up. Fantastic. And I'm going to get this loaded. You guys let me know uh, once you can see my slides. It's nothing yeah, again. So let's let's see how, we, area. how did we fix that the last time? Eugene, can you help with that? Eugene is also on here, our tech person. Uh, Mark, you may want to go back to the main screen. Okay. So try clicking uh, display settings. Oh, there you go. And uh, just do uh, from the beginning for the slideshow, the top left. And we're still showing that slide on the side, aren't we? Uh, might be able to adjust it by hitting display settings. There you go. Try that one. That one? Yeah, that's right. Perfect. That's it. There you go the days we live in. So uh, thanks everybody for attending. Um, kind of the, uh, my name is Mark Klein. I know a lot of the folks on the, on the call probably 
we've either met or you at least know me by name or we've traded emails or we've spoken before. Uh, but I am the regional director for Exim Bank uh, based in Louisville, Kentucky. And then I cover a good chunk of the Midwest. I cover Ohio, Kentucky, Missouri, Kansas, uh, Southern Indiana, Southern Illinois is kind of my, my path of destruction as I like to call it. Uh, plan for attack today is, is I kind of want to talk a little bit as far as what Exim Bank is, how we kind of fit into the global picture, if you will. I am a federal government agency, so that means I'm going to talk a little bit about eligibility and rules. Imagine that a, a government agency that has rules. Um, I'm then going to get into our core products, actually what we do to help exporters. And then I've got a couple of topics at the very end, uh, what I call cleanup topics that I'm going to address a little bit. And if we do this right, I'm going to have plenty of time at the end to take more questions and answers. We will be taking a couple breaks along the way as I transition from one section into another. I'll give Kim a quick shout out and ask her if she can, uh, if there's anything sitting in the in the chat room, we'll, we'll address those questions as we come along. So uh, without further ado, first thing, Export Import Bank of the United States, that's a whole lot of words. So we like to refer to ourselves as Exim, just Exim, E-X-I-M. Uh, we are the official export credit agency for the United States. And remember that term export credit agency or abbreviated ECA. There again, government, we abbreviate everything. So ECAs, and just remember that because that's something that that uh, we'll, we'll touch base on. And, and as I like to jokingly say, the ECA financing is what makes the world go round. And I've got a slide that, that kind of demonstrates that a little bit. So we are a, an executive branch agency. We've been around since 1934. Uh, we were initially, we were founded during the New Deal. We initially were the Export Import Bank of Washington, DC. And then we eventually became the Export Import Bank of the United States. Um, we are what's called a sunset agency. And what that basically means is that we're temporary. Now we've been temporary now since 1934 but we're still considered a temporary agency. Unlike the Small Business Administration, they are a permanent agency. Temporary agency just basically means that every four to five years, Congress has to vote on us to have the ability to keep doing what we do. And you know, I think we're into our 18th reauthorization is what that process is called when Congress votes on us. Um, we had some hiccups. 2015 through 2019, we had a big hiccup. Um, we had some problems with our, our reauthorization. Uh, we had some board quorum issues, which really limited what we could do. But eventually, December of 2019, we were granted a seven year reauthorization, the longest reauthorization in the history of Exxon Bank. So now we don't have to have the reauthorization conversation until September 30th of 2026. We'll start talking about it a little before then because that's typically when we start asking for support from the World Trade Centers and the MEPs and the Association of Manufacturers and the District Export Councils. And, you know, we try to drum up support to convince congressmen to, to, to vote us to, to keep going for another four to five years. And, and once we actually do get to the floor of both the House and the Senate, overwhelming majority votes for us to continue doing what we do. So it's there, there, we have an overwhelming majority in both the House and the Senate. It's just occasionally it's it's the way government is. It, it doesn't take too many things to come off the rails before it can real uh, throw a monkey wrench into everything. So um, there again, going back to 1934, our role is to help US companies, small, medium and large, increase jobs or sustain current jobs through exports. And we're gonna, in, in that whole jobs, 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 you're gonna hear me talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit further because that is, that's an important part of what our charter is all about. It's all about creating and sustaining jobs. I talked about the other, e about ECAs, this export credit agency. There's over a hundred ECAs in the world, every single, developed country 
has a version of Exim Bank. Developing countries have Exim Banks. Nigeria has an Exim Bank. India has an Exim Bank. Russia has an Exim Bank. China has five or six Exim Banks. Here's some of the ones that, that we're more familiar with here. Uh, my friends to the north in Canada, it's called Export Development Canada. That's their ECA. Germany, Euler Hermes, that's their ECA. Uh, France has COFAS, Italy has SACE. And the, the reason I bring that out, and this is a really busy slide, I, I apologize, but the information, it tell, it, it's very telling. So if you look over at the United States, we've did uh, in last year, 2019, we did $5.3 billion in what's called official export finance. So that's basically anything that, that I touch, any export that my assistance is needed to make that transaction happen. We were involved in $5.3 billion of that. Now the big red dot over to the right, that's China. 33.5 billion from the Chinese Exim Banks. So China Exim Bank did six times the volume that the US did. If you look at that big circle in the middle, that's the Eurozone. I did some quickie math. Uh, 57.5 billion in exports. So the Eurozone did about 10 times what we did. Now I say that not because nothing, you know, that Exxon Bank, we just can't keep up or anything like that. It's just that the rest of the world, the exporters in China, the exporters in Italy, the exporters in Germany, the exporters in India, they utilize the services of their Exxon Bank a lot more than the exporters in the United States do. So that's why I do a lot of webinars. The, I always say I, I, I make a lot of speeches, I shake a lot of hands, I kiss a lot of babies, just to try to help spread the word to let exporters know exactly that we're here, we, we wanna help. I don't care if you are a large corporate entity, I don't care if you're a one person small business, our services apply to you. Um, so that's, uh, that's the reason for my busy map, just to, to kind of drive home that point that, um, you know, we need, we need to play catch up a little bit with the rest of the world. So what the role of an ECA, there again, the Export Credit Agency, we're not trying to compete with traditional financing that's available, the private sector, the, the, the commercial financing. We're, we're supplementing it. So the idea there is what we like to call, we level the playing field. In doing so, we like to minimize risk for all parties involved with the transaction. And there's a 90% of the time, a transaction takes place without me, the federal government, having to stick my nose into it. So 90% of transactions happen just the way they're supposed to do. Companies obtain the working capital they need from their banks without my assistance. The buyers outside of the US, they purchase the product without me needing to supply any type of, of, of short-term or medium-term or long-term credit assistance. So 90% of the time, everything works just fine. It's that other 10% of the time is where we come in and basically we, we fix what the private sector doesn't have a fix for. We're kind of a Band-Aid is, is a good way to look at it. Um, this is the rest of the world. This is, and this is where I age myself. I do this all the time is this is from the old Popeye commercials or the old Popeye cartoons. This is Wimpy. He's famous for, I will gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. If you're an exporter, get used to this. Put this on your refrigerator, put this on your desk, just to remind yourself. This is, if you're in the export world, this is what you're gonna face. It's typically, the buyers of US products, they're usually looking for some type of supplier financing. It's very rare that they're going to like cash up front. They don't like letters of credit. They are more or less just like Wimpy. I will gladly pay you in 60 days what you export to me today. Or they're gonna ask for you to arrange a longer term financing solution, which most of my companies, their response is, I'm not a bank, I don't do that. Well, that's why you call me, because what we do is, is if you have a buyer that is looking for either a short-term 60, 90-day solution, or they're looking for a longer-term, three, four, five-year solution, that's where I come into play. I, I've 
done this a lot of times and um, I always say, and, and I know different entities have, you know, the, if you talk to the, to the folks, um, you know, they'll tell you that, you know, if you're trying to do business in Japan, you have to present your business card with two hands. Very important. Other markets you have to, if you're trying to do something in Latin America, you may have to, you know, to go out to dinner six or seven times before you actually, you know, finalize that deal. I will tell you the, the way that, that U.S. companies lose business is they assume that our buyers outside of the U.S. can manage their own financing. And they can't for a variety of reasons. There's illiquid banks, there's, there's credit markets that aren't as efficient. So you need to assume that, that your buyer is going to ask for help on the financing side. Uh, and nine times out of 10, they're going to want you to come up with that solution for them. So that's why I like my wimpy, my wimpy cartoon is just to remind everybody that doing business outside the U.S. it's it's not necessarily the same as doing business inside of the U.S. Um, so this is where um, Kim. Uh, before I get into the eligibility and the rules and stuff, anything in the chat room yet? Fantastic! Um, yeah. I see you shaking. You're shaking yeah. your head. So I'm going to move forward. Yeah. Um, so this is where Exum kind of comes into play. Uh, we've got. There again, the three core products I'm going to dig into a little bit is pre-export financing. So the pre-export financing is basically what we can do for the U.S. exporter, the U.S. supplier. How can we assist them with their working capital needs prior to export? Post-export, this is more answers to the question, what can we do for your buyer to help solve that access to capital issue whether it's a short term or a long term. So that's kind of just the, the broad stroke of what I'm going to talk about when we get into our core products. Um, and there again, how we, the short term side, accounts receivable, insurance, we're going to talk about that. Buyer financing, I'm going to dig into that. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up a little bit with that working capital guarantee. So those first two areas, the, the uh, export credit insurance, the receivables insurance, that's, that's that whole uh, post-export financing, the, the long and the short term or the long and the medium term financing, um, that's post-export and then working capital is, is the pre-export. The fun part, here's the rules. Uh, companies that we like to do business with, at least on the U.S. perspective, we like to see companies that have been at least been in business for three years. Government entities, we just don't have a real good solution for startups. It's just the way it is. I, I wish it wasn't the case, but but startups, we, we I don't have a real good track record of that. So three years operation, uh, one year um, showing revenue from operations. You don't necessarily have to be profitable, but just show me that you've been in business for three years. If I go to the, the, the Kentucky State Secretary of State's office, I can see your company listed with the Secretary of State. Three business, you got your financial statement, Dunn's number, make sure you have a Dunn and Bradstreet number. And there's there's easy ways to obtain that. Uh, there's even a, if, if you need, if there's a, there's a website specifically for, if you need that Dunn and Bradstreet number to do business with the US government, there's a free, a quick and easy way for you to get a Dunn's number uh, very quickly. Um, so that's all I'm gonna say about that. That's the, the you know, three years in business from the exporters. Country limitation schedule. We we call this our Bible. And uh, Stacy or Kim, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead. It's okay if we make this uh, presentation available to everybody. If we can send it out to them afterwards, uh, that link at the bottom. There's actually some. Uh, that's a live link. It's to our country limitation schedule. It's basically it's a spreadsheet. Every single country that you could possibly be doing business with, we detail whether we're open for coverage or closed for coverage in that market. We're open in most. The ones that, that you're gonna see that we're closed in, you know, shockers. I'm, I'm closed in Cuba. I'm closed in North Korea. I'm closed in Syria. You know, I'm, I'm, those are the ones I can't, I can't help you with. Um, State Department tells you I can't help you in those. There's gonna be some that I'm closed in because the credit markets are just a mess. Venezuela is a good example. The State Department pretty much says you got to avoid some of the, the sanctioned entities, but the State Department will say you can do business with Venezuela all you want to. I'm going to say 
be really, really, really careful in Venezuela because I can't get comfortable with the credit markets. And if I can't get comfortable with the credit markets, you shouldn't get comfortable with the credit markets. So the moral of that story is if you see I'm closed in a market, that's a cash up front market because post-export financing is not going to be available. Letters of credit. I don't know a single bank that will confirm a Venezuelan bank issued letter of credit at the present time. So there again, the rule of thumb, if I don't like the credit risk, I'm not going to recommend that a, a small, medium or large business that they get comfortable with the credit risk. So that's country limitation schedule. Um, I get asked this a lot. You know, if, if you're going to put insurance in place, if you're going to try to arrange financing for a buyer, what information are you going to need from my customer? This kind of details it a little bit. Um, if I'm going to put an insurance policy in place and the most that your buyer could owe you at one point in time is $100,000, i am going to work off of credit reports, trade references, ledger history that you have with them. Uh, $100,000. To three hundred thousand, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna look I'm gonna dig a little deeper. Credit reports, trade history, ledgers. Maybe we get some financials. Over five hundred thousand. If the most that that company is gonna owe you at one point in time that I'm putting insurance in place for, if it goes how, over half a million, I want to look at everything. I got to see a good credit report. I want to see some some trade references where they've actually paid people on time, and I got to see some financials. So 500,000, it's two year financials. If that exposure goes over a million, it's three years financials. You know, it's, it's, it's that common sense to where the, the, the higher the risk dollar amount, the, the more I kind of want to know a little bit about your buyer. So military is, we call this our charter restrictions. Military is the biggie. Um, I can't help you. you know, I just can't do things that go boom. And if your buyer likes things that go boom, that's pretty much going to be a no-go for me. So if you're selling product to, you know, first of all, if you're selling machine guns and fighter jets and tanks and fighter helicopters, I'm not going to be a solution. I'm not saying you can't do it, um, but for the most part, if what you're exporting, if you need ITAR compliance, which is international traffic of arms regulations. That's a, another step you have to go through with the government. If, if you have to get ITAR approval, that's pretty much gonna mean that, that I have to back out of the transaction. Um, so that's if it's the stuff that you're exporting, that, that I can't help on that. Uh, if you're selling pencils, if you're selling good old Ticonderoga number two pencils to the Egyptian military, I can't help with that either. Because guaranteed, all those those number two pencils, you can't really hurt somebody with a number two pencil, although I, I did get stabbed a couple of times in grade school. Uh, you can't really hurt people with a number two pencil. But guess what? That Egyptian military, they're probably using those number two pencils, and they're not doing crossword puzzles with them. They're probably using those number two pencils for something that I just can't support. So military is typically it's it's a gray area for us it's not always an automatic and this is kind of you know some some of the different instances um if you're selling you know to the foreign military but they're using it for humanitarian purposes um so this, you know good example i think i have it on the next slide or um i can give you a real live example of it uh we were asked by the mexican military to support a transaction to where they were gonna be buying a lot of the, what I call the large pavilion type tents. The kind of tents that you set up for wedding receptions and you know, big, 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 big tents. Well, normally that transaction is not gonna be something I could support. In this case, the, the Mexican military was buying these tents. They were gonna use them as temporary housing for individuals that uh, there was a hurricane or there was an earthquake, you know, so it's humanitarian purposes to provide temporary shelter to someone that was displaced from their home due to a, a hurricane, earthquake, potentially a forest fire. Those are things that we can support because it's in that humanitarian aid bucket. So there are some, there again, back to the, to the fighter jets and machine guns, there's not a whole lot of gray area involved with machine guns and fighter jets. I, you know, that's going to be a tough one. But if it is something to where it's tents or 
um, you know, if we're going to ask, you know, what's the formula, you know, if you're trying to sell, you know, fire trucks into China, for the most point, for the most part, that buying entity in China is going to be some branch of the military. That's just how they do things. But if it's going to be a fire truck that the foreign military is buying, but it's going to be used for civilian fire protection in a certain providence, but it's not really, it just happens to be the military's buying it, but it's not going to be used by the military. There again, gray area. We're going to ask a lot of questions, but at the end of the day, hopefully that's something that we can support. Content. This is the biggie. And this goes back to that U.S. jobs, where we're trying to support and sustain U.S. jobs. U.S. content just basically says, I like stuff and I like services that are majority made in the United States doesn't have to be 100% made in the United States. It has to be final assembly in the United States, final shipped from the United States. But in the grand scheme of things, if the little rubber buttons come from China, but everything else, if it's assembled here, research development, labor overhead is all in the United States, the little rubber buttons are gonna be just fine. And in the insurance world, it's 50% is kind of that threshold. It's 50% on a cost basis. So if your gadget cost of goods sold is $100, that's pre-margin, that's pre pre-profit, factory cost $100, just show me that at least 50 of that is from the United States. There again, raw materials, labor, research development, overhead, just you know, final assembly in the US, ship from the US. If some of the components come from outside of the US, that's fine. Just get me over that 50% threshold and you're gonna be just fine with me. Um, so content's kind of the biggie that we like to talk about. Kim, how are we doing on chat? Anything? Shaking your head? No, perfect. We'll, 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 we'll keep plugging through. Um, so this goes back to, now I'm gonna get into our, to the kind of the real meat and potatoes. This is our core products. And this is the this is our export credit insurance. So this is the the product one of two of our uh, post export finance. Export credit insurance, plain and simple, gives you the exporter the ability to offer open account terms to basically treat those international customers. Remember Wimpy, he's they're always going to be asking for open account terms. It gives you the ability to do business with them on the open account with my backing it. So the I we always like to say that we're in the sleep business, that we, we like to keep we like to keep our exporters from waking up at 2 30 in the morning in a cold sweat. So what we do is we step in with insurance. We say it's okay to offer open account terms on your export sales because I'm going to put an insurance plan in place. I'm going to provide 90% if it's a single buyer, and I've got a slide that kind of details this a little bit more. 90% coverage if it's a single buyer, 95% coverage if it's a multi-buyer. If you're selling grain straight out of the silo, we're going to call that bulk ad, that's 98% protection. If you're selling to a sovereign entity, it's 100% protection. So we're allowing you to mitigate a huge percent of your repayment risk, you're transferring that over to the US government. And that does a couple things. Uh, first and foremost, hopefully you're gonna sleep at night because you're not gonna worry about that open account sale that you just made to a distributor in Turkey. You're not gonna worry about it. The foreign buyer is gonna be very excited because they're again, think, you know, Wimpy Burger. They, they don't like cash up front. They don't like letters of credit. If you're trying to do business and sell into, I'll use two examples. If you're trying to sell into Egypt and Argentina at the present time, they are not legally allowed to pay you up front. Their central bank will not allow payment to be remitted until your product is in their country. So as soon as that product hits their port, they can pay you, but they can't make advance payments. So there's always going to be, if you're trying to do business in Egypt and Argentina, there's always going to be some type of an open account basis. I can put in insurance, uh, save the day. And if we have any of the, uh, any bankers that are on the call, this is where I, and if we were doing this in person, I always ask my bankers to smile really wide because once we insure a foreign account receivable, 
that makes bankers very happy because number one, they're not scared that this exporter has this incredible amount of export risk that they have to manage. But also once I insure a foreign account receivable, that becomes a, in essence, a domestic account receivable. And they will then include that in your asset base and they will let, they will let you borrow against an insured foreign account receivable to where if it's an uninsured foreign account receivable, they are not gonna to touch it with a 10 foot pole. So helps you sleep at night, makes your buyers happy and it makes your bankers happy. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, we have some, I said before that I can help small, medium, large businesses, I can. I've got a couple, um, I'm gonna go to this slide. We've got a couple programs specifically for small business. So the Express Insurance, Small Business Multi-Buyer, those are, are small business. And the way that we keep score on the small business is basically if the SBA says you're a small business, I'm gonna call you a small business too. And I know that the SBA has a variety of, of ways that they calculate small business. But for the most part, if you're a manufacturer, 500 employees or less, you're a small business. If you're a wholesaler or a reseller, you're a trading company, less than 100 employees, you're a small business. Now, there's some manufacturing sectors that I think you can go up to 1,500 employees and still be considered a small business. But for the most part, SBA says you're a small business. I'm probably going to call you a small business unless you are, if you read the fine print on the Express or the small business multi-buyer, if you're a small business, but you are just knocking it out of the ballpark with your export sales, which knocking out of the ballpark is more than seven and a half million. Um, you're a small business, but technically we're going to, we're going to try to find you a home in one of our other programs because Although you are a small business by employee size, you're not going to think like a small business because you're already experts on the export side. And you probably don't need, you know, if you look at that express insurance, I, I call that my training wheels policy. That's for companies that are either new to exporting, new to using export credit insurance. They're going to need a lot of hand holding. This is kind of my, my training wheels policy. Small business multi-buyer policy, that's kind of the next stage. There again, for small business. Um, the nice thing about small business, I'm gonna talk a little bit about small business in, in, in the, the other two, the standard multi-buyer and the reasonable spread of risk. The small business is what we call flat rate premiums. So let's talk about pricing. I, I, I mentioned the, you get to sleep at night, we make your buyers happy, we make your bankers happy. The question I usually get is, well, how expensive is this? And my answer is it's dirt cheap. I wish there was a, it, it's just, it's so inexpensive. So if you look at that small business multi-buyer column, if you're offering terms up to 60 days from date of export, that's your, you're allowing your exporter to pay you up to 60 days from date of export. I'm going to charge you 0.55%. $100,000 invoice, 95% protection, 60 days coverage, on a $100,000 invoice, it's gonna cost you a whopping $550. Dirt cheap, so inexpensive, pass that cost on to your buyer. They will happily pay it because, and, and round up. Everybody that's ever heard me, he talk about this, I always say round up. You know, if I'm gonna charge you 55, you know, 0.55%, 55 basis points for 60 days, charge your buyer a full percent, just makes the math easier. That way you're charging them 1% on 60 days. That's the equivalent of 6% cost of funds on an annual basis. They can't touch 6% money at their bank. So you're giving them a cheaper financing alternative than what they could get if they go to their bank and try to borrow the money. And you're basically, you're covering my cost. And if you're gonna charge them, you know, same $100,000 invoice, you're gonna charge them $1,000 for those 60 days. You collect a thousand dollars, I get five hundred and fifty. You keep the other four hundred and fifty, and you buy pizza or donuts for the office for a month. Whatever you want to do, it's just you know, it's it just keeps the math simple, and it, it just demonstrates it's so easy to pass this cost on your buyer, and they will readily pay for it because they're again a, a supplier financing alternative is much less expensive than what they can get from the bank, and they don't have to talk to their banker. 
There again, bankers on the phone, my apologies. But for the most part, people don't like going to their banker a whole lot. They would rather avoid that conversation because bankers, and I'm a recovering banker. I was a banker for 20 years before I joined Exxon Bank. A lot of times bankers have to say no, and nobody likes to hear no. So, you know, if they can come up with a supplier financing solution and they don't have to worry about their banker telling them no, uh, that's just going to make everybody happier. So that's under the small business multi-buyer, it's, it's what we call flat rate pricing. It's the idea that I don't care what countries you are exporting to, my rate is going to be 0.55% up to 60 days, 0.90% up to 120 days. The standard multi-buyer and, and what we call the reasonable spread of risk, the managed spread of risk policy, I'm going to build a premium rate based on where you're actually going to use the product. So if you're, if you're mostly selling into Western Europe and Canada, I'm going to build a premium rate for Western Europe and Canadian risk. That's going to be a, a pretty attractive premium rate because we're going to deem Western, Can you know, Western Europe and Canada. That's going to be some low risk markets. If you're primarily exporting to West Africa in Latin America, I'm going to build a premium rate for that portfolio. That's probably going to be a little bit higher because those are going to be some of your higher risk markets. If you're a small business, I'm going to quote you both a small business that flat rate. I'm going to quote you a standard multi-buyer as well. And as a small business, you get to pick which one is best for you. So if you're a small business doing business in Latin America, Africa, parts of the Middle East, parts of Asia, I'm going to tell you, you're probably, if you qualify for that small business multi-buyer, take it and run. Because when I build you a premium rate, under my standard multi-buyer or my managed spread of risk, that premium rate is gonna be higher than 0.55%. Nice thing is we, you know, and, and this is when I've, if I was sitting across a table, uh, I get the eye roll sometimes because, you know, a government agency, I'm gonna tell you that we're pretty easy to get along with and that we really wanna do what's best for you. Um, so if, if what's best for you is the standard multi-buyer, I'm going to, to, to encourage you, standard multi-buyer is the best route for you. If a small business multi-buyer is the best, I'm going to encourage small business multi-buyer is a better rate for you. Um, so, but that is, we are, we, we take pride in the fact that although we are a government agency, we're a fairly small government agency, about 500 employees. Um, we, we do, we're very sensitive to what our, our exporters really need from us. And there's a lot of, of consulting that we, that we offer and, you know, as regional director there again, I, I cover my six state territory and, you know, I'm always consulting with, with companies and with their banks and with their attorneys and their accountants to, to try to make sure that I come up with a solution that makes sense for everybody. Now, this is, this is a separate, so the, the previous chart that I had up was our, that's our multi-buyers. So multi-buyer is just what it sounds like. You're, you have, you're going to have one policy and you're going to have a number of uh, approved buyers housed under that policy. A single buyer is exactly what it sounds like. You're going to come to me and say, Mark, I don't really have an export portfolio for you. I'm only dealing with one customer or Mark, I'm perfectly fine self-insuring the risk on my existing distributors. I just want to start putting policies in place for the new guys that I come on board, but I, I don't need a comprehensive solution. This is my single buyer. Provides 90% protection. Multi-buyer is 95% protection. So basically, I'm going to say that you can come to me and say, Mark, I'm taking on a new distributor in Turkey. The rest of the world, I'm not worried about, but this guy's too new. I don't have a good track record for him. He wants too long of a term. I like him at 60 days. He wants 120 or I like him at 100,000 and he wants 300,000. Whatever the reason, you can come to me with just that one, and I'm, I'm gonna put a policy in place on a buyer by buyer basis. And I can have any number of these running concurrently. So it's not that, that uh, you know, that I'm always gonna be trying to, to come up with that. I'm always gonna talk about the comprehensive risk solution, that multi-buyer solution, because 95% protection is better than 90. And typically my pricing under a multi-buyer scenario, my premium rate's usually a little bit better, 
Uh, if you kind of look at it in the real world, you know, the multi buyers, you know, my pricing on a multi buyer is is basically if you come to, you know, you go to your local state farm agent and say, look, I need I need uh, premium rates. I need coverage for my house, my cars, my motorcycle, my rental property and my boat. They're going to give you a really nice blended rate. If you go to your state farm guy and say, you know what, I just need insurance for my 16 year old son who got his driver's license. You're going to pay more. It's just the way it is. It's selective risk. And you're not going to, if they even put a policy in place, if all you're giving them is a 16 year old son that just got his driver's license, it's going to be a little bit more expensive than if you, if you give them everything. Um, we'll, we'll come back if there's any questions on export credit insurance. I want to make sure I leave plenty of time. Um, foreign buyer financing. This is basically think capital equipment. Think over 500,000. And this is where your buyer is coming to you, not needing 60, 90 day terms. If they're coming to you and they just need 60, day, 60 or 90 day terms, they've got the money to pay for your stuff. They've got the financing taken care of. They just want a little bit of a breathing room. They don't want to have to pay you up front. They don't want to have to go get a letter of credit. They just need a little breathing room, but they've got the money. Medium term is basically if you're selling capital equipment, your buyer may not have the financing lined up. You know, it could be to where, um, you know, the banks in a lot of markets very illiquid. It could be, it's not that, that your buyer is not credit worthy. It's just the financing is not available for them. So we can put, an, we can put a facility in place that basically allows that buyer to tap into an export credit agency, an ECA. Remember the ECA financing makes the world go round. Um, it allows them to tap, to tap into an ECA guaranteed loan structure that is gonna be 10, much more affordable than what they could get in country. So Latin America, we're talking about interest rates for the typical walking around you know, buyer, interest rates in the teens. I can arrange financing with all the costs and everything lined in, all in cost, you know, four and a half, five percent. Very affordable financing. Um, there's no liquidity issues to where, if, you know, maybe they can get a, they're in Brazil, they can get a 13 and a half percent loan on a two year payback. I can provide a five year payback at maybe six percent in Brazil. So a little bit cheaper interest rate, a little bit longer term, and that's because I'm putting a 100% principal and interest guarantee on that loan. I don't lend the money. I've got bank in my name, but I don't lend the money. We work with lenders that provide that financing to that buyer with my guarantee in place. So this is basically cap, think capital equipment, 500,000 and up is where this comes into play. And if you're, if you're selling into there again, Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe, basically all the markets outside of Western Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, to where the, the banks are a little bit illiquid at the present time. Uh, they were a little bit illiquid before COVID. Now that, that COVID, they're really illiquid. Um, the, the banks are very nervous. A lot of the governments are very nervous because not only has the COVID crisis kind of taken its toll, but now they're dealing with the fact of, of how much is the recovery process gonna take? How expensive is it going to be to basically bring our markets back to life during the next 12 to 18 months? So a lot, a lot, of, a lot of nervous folks out there with the, with, the, with the bank accounts in the world. Working capital guarantee, this is kind of that third um, core product that I talked about. This is basically just a quick overview of this. The SBA has a flavor for this. I have a flavor for this. It's basically, you're still going to work with your bank here, whether that's Fifth Third Bank, Huntington Bank, Key Bank, Commerce Bank, you're still going to work with their bank. They're going to provide the line of credit to you to support your exports, either me or the SBA. We're going to provide a 90% principal and interest guarantee to that bank. So, and I can only do with the, deal with the export side. So if you're looking to grow your exports and your banker is saying no, bankers sometimes say that, we talked about that already. If your banker is saying no, um, possibly with a government guarantee, 
I may be able, I'm not real good at turning a no into a yes. I'm pretty good at turning a yes, but into a yes, because there again, the bank, it's a 90% principal and interest guarantee. The bank's got to like the deal. They've got to like the exporter. They've got to like the exporter's business. They basically have to like everything about the deal, aside from the fact that it's an export transaction and things get a little wonky on export transactions sometimes. So if they like the deal, but they're again, but, um, you know, a 90% government backstop is going to help them get it through credit committee. That's where I can come into play. And this is kind of that pre-export financing piece that I talked about earlier. Um, here's the cleanup part. And then we're going to be ready for, for Q and A if we have any um, services. Can I support services? I get asked that a lot. Yes. Services is fine. Most of what we do on the export credit insurance, the foreign buyer financing and the working cap. It is we can help if you're an architectural firm, an advertising firm, software firm, and you're not exporting stuff, but you're exporting stuff that lives in the clouds, you know, service contracts. We can support that. Um, gets a little tricky because there again, our, you know, our export credit insurance, you know, one of the important documents in our export credit insurance is that ocean bill of lading or an airway bill that shows that you have exported the product. If you're an architecture firm or if you're a legal firm, you're not sticking a bunch of attorneys and, and architects into a container and, and putting them on a boat. You know, this is you're not going to have an ocean bill of lading or an airway bill if you're providing legal service or, or you're consulting on an architect's project. So we have to get a little creative. You know, what is that evidence of export going to look like without an ocean bill of lading or an airway bill? Well, we can do it. Um, another cleanup, and th this is something that's been getting a lot of press, is we have what's called a China and Transformational Export Initiative. You know, this is basically Exim Bank as part of our charter do something about the fact that China is winning all this business around the globe through their five or six Exim banks. Do something about that. So what we're trying to do is, is with this China transformational exports, if you are exporting stuff or services in these 10 industries, we can, what we're looking to do is add some flexibility, okay? So I'm gonna leave, you know, there again, you guys are gonna get the, the, the copy of this. I can come back to that, but basically what it's gonna do in there again, if you qualify in these seven factors, I'll leave this slide up there for a minute. Um, if you're in those 10 industries and you can demonstrate that you're potentially going to lose an opportunity or not being allowed to bid on opportunity, because basically the, the financing that China is arranging through their export credit agencies, if that's blocking you and you can document that, come to us and we have a little bit of flexibility. We have some flexibility on that US content requirement that I talked about earlier. We have some flexibility on the, the terms. We have a little bit of flexibility on how we structure the financing. Uh, so basically, you know, going back to the previous slide, if you're doing something in water treatment, you're putting a water plant or a, a water treatment plant in Ghana, in West Africa, and you know that, that uh, you're losing out to China because they're getting a little overly creative with the financing, this is a case to where this China and transformational exports, this is where this initiative could come into play to where we might be able to add a little bit of flexibility to what we would normally do to hopefully win the business because there again, we're all about jobs. We want you to win the business. We don't want the Chinese to win the business. We want you to win the business because you're going to have to hire more people to fulfill that contract. And this is where I shut up and we see if there's any questions out there. And feel free to. Um, this is my this is my phone number. That's my cell phone. Uh, feel free to call me. That's my email address. Feel reach. Feel free to reach out to me um, at any point in time. 
So I guess we can check the chats if we want to unmute people or however you want to do that, Kim, we can, we, we've uh, put some aside, uh, put a little bit of time for questions and answers. Um, there are no questions in the chat, but if anyone wants to um, go ahead and unmute and ask a question, um, that would be great. And while we're doing that, I'm going to share a different slide. So hopefully everyone, are we seeing my website right now instead of my PowerPoint? Fantastic. Yep. Here's that country limitation schedule that I talked about earlier that is just an incredible tool. Um, and we'll just go ahead and we'll jump in. We'll just pick E. I don't know why I picked E, but we picked E. So there again, every country that you could possibly think about exporting to, um, you know, let's say you've got a project in Egypt. So we look at Egypt and this is a good example because you will see both public, private sector, Y's across the board, Y's are good, they're in green, no is red, no's are bad. Up to one year, that column is basically that export credit insurance I talked about. One to seven years, that's that foreign buyer financing that I talked about, but these are typically deals that are under the 20 to $25 million price tag. Over seven years, those are the biggies. Those are the months, the monster 100,000 or $100 million infrastructure projects. But you can see in, in Egypt, I'm open in Egypt. That's a good thing. Egypt's a tricky market. And you can tell that it's tricky because if you look up here and we'll have these on every single country, you're gonna see notes. What those notes tell you, and the notes are very important. I always like to say that's where the fun is because the notes will tell you that yes, Exxon Bank is open across the board. Why is across the board at the present time? But you have to look at some of the notes and that this is where you get into the yes, Exxon Bank is open, but, and I will tell you that the big but in Egypt right now is for the most part, if I'm gonna put insurance in place or I'm gonna arrange some type of financing, I'm gonna need some type of a local Egyptian bank to be involved because the credit market in Egypt is a little bit shaky right now. It's, I'm having trouble getting good credit information on buyers in Egypt. So what a lot of times what we have to do is we have to rely on their banks in country that may have a good relationship. And we have to kind of, we have to lean on that local bank a little bit, either maybe with a letter of credit or some type of a guarantee before we can really work directly with a, an Egyptian buyer. Um, but every country, then you go to the, to the easy ones. There's France, wise across the board, no notes. France is pretty much, you know, as you would expect, Western Europe, wide open. Uh, let's get to, to one that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, oh, here's my friends in Venezuela. You will see those are big ends. That's a big no-no. Um, and the note 13 up here, where it says note 13, it just basically says that, uh, you know, we're closed for credit reasons in Venezuela. However, if you can find a way to get that guaranteed by an entity outside of Venezuela, let's say that it's a company that you're exporting to in Venezuela to support their oil industry, but they're the parent to that company is actually out of Brazil. Maybe it's Petrobras or something out of Brazil. If you can externalize and kind of make that Venezuelan risk go away, because now I can tie all my exposure with the parent in Brazil, I can do it. Um, so country limitation schedule, good tool, good tool to have it. It's, you know, right there on a website and, and pretty easy to, to get to. And, you know, there again, www.exum.gov. Um, you know, there's a lot of content on here learning resource, I've got videos, there's there's probably recorded webinars of something similar that I did today. Um, good good place to go. Um, anyhow, since we taken a break from questions and answers, I thought we would, we would do that real quick. Right, that was a great introduction and I feel like we're just scratching the surface with what you have presented today. But also I'm on the phone with our manufacturers every day and I hope that you know the information that you've given me, I can pass along and that will give them some confidence to get started. 
you know, that, that's what they're looking for is some confidence. And, and with the insurance that you've um, presented to us, you know, like I said, that just scratches the surface, but at least it gives me some talking points to encourage our manufacturers to, um, to jumpstart their, their exporting endeavors. Yeah. So. Most companies don't know that we exist. Um, that's, it's, 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 it's just, that's the way it is. Usually when I, when I give a presentation, one of the first things that I do is, uh, you know, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but I usually follow the SBA. Everybody knows the SBA, small business administration. That's where I get my PPP loans. Everybody knows the SBA even before PPP, everybody knew SBA. Um, I usually ask people, okay, who's ever heard of the export import bank before? I'll get a couple hands that'll you know and they're not really it's not like they shoot you know you know it, it's usually a you know maybe i think i know who exim is and then you know so most companies you know export credit insurance a lot of companies they don't know any other way other than cash in advance go to your bank and get a letter of credit they don't know that there's a way that they can treat those foreign customers similar to how they treat their domestic customers with me helping them sleep at night, with me taking a majority of the risk off the table. Mark? We actually do have a question that came into the chat. It says, with the challenges in developing countries, do you get to extend payment dates in case the importers fail to remit on the due date? So I guess they're asking about, are there possibilities for extension? Yeah, here's that's a, it's a good question. It's not necessarily an extension, but we, we allow a lot of wiggle room is the best way to look at it. So if you're, if you were, if you gave your customer 60 day terms, you were supposed to get paid on day 60, day 61, they're now officially one day past due. We require that that customer or that the exporter work with that buyer 90 days before they can even file a claim with us. Now, typically, that's not an official payment extension. We can do that if if require if asked to, but typically, it's just a matter of of what you know. U.S. companies typically do is they work with their customers that that ran into a snag and they're just paying a little bit slow. We build that 90-day cushion in there for the simple fact that that most things in the business world take care of themselves without the federal government having to step in. Now, if your buyer declares bankruptcy or, or files for insolvency, you're going to file a claim immediately because there, there's no going back from that. But yeah, you, you, you have the ability, you have the flexibility. You're we're actually, we're going to mandate a little bit of 90 day flexibility to try to figure out what's going on at the end of the 90 days. That's when you can file a claim with me and get either the 90 to 95 or 98 or hundred percent, whatever your coverage on your policy is. That ability to file a claim, we it stays open for five months. Hmm. So if this is a company that you've built a relationship with decades and they've just hit a snag, COVID, there's a pretty big snag, you know, to where, you know, they couldn't pay in the 90 days. Now, at day 90, you could file a claim, but you still want to work with these guys a little bit. We give you the ability to work with them an additional five months past the 90 days. So now once they get to the point, so 90 days plus five months, once they get eight months past due, guess what? We're going to say, guys, you got to file a claim. This isn't going to get any better. Eight months is long enough. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of flexibility uh, that we give you because ultimately it's your relationship. We're just the insurance company. Right. You know, we're, 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 we're protecting you from things that, that go boom in the night. <laughs> um, you know, so we, we let you, uh, as much as we can, we let you man, you know, you manage that relationship you have with your buyers. Excellent. There's a little bit more in the chat from the same, um, guest, and I will put the two of you in touch. We are right at, um, our time and I don't want to invade on anyone's time. I think you've given us a lot of information to think about. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, there again, my, my email address, cell phones on the slide, um, in, unless I'm, I've, I'm all, I'm pretty good about answering my emails, um, phones. If, if, if I'm not on an existing call or an existing webinar, um, pretty good at answering my phones too. 
So. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, okay. Mark. I appreciate it. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, you've got my email address, you've got Mark's contact information. So please feel free to reach out to us. I will share the video presentation as well as the slide presentation. Um, and I want you to keep an eye out for our next um, webinars on April 1st. We'll be talking about competitive intelligence, uh, learning about your competition and where you fit in uh, to that, uh, that data. And then on April 15th, progressive discipline, um, Leslie Russ will be talking about how to manage conflict and conduct within your organization, um, the legalities behind um, disciplinary actions and um, basically maintaining a healthy and peaceful work environment. So um, I just wanna thank everybody for coming and feel free to reach out to AKA or uh, Market XM if you need any more information. And everybody have a great day.